Okay, why don't we get uh, started? So, uh, good afternoon. My name is Chadwick Chow, and I, um, I'm a software developer at Oracle. My focus at Oracle is to uh, develop tools and reusable components and libraries um, for developers to build enterprise application. And my current project that I'm working on is Oracle Jet, and that's um, something that I will discuss later on in the session. So, um, some legal stuff out of the way first. Um, so today we're going to talk about enterprise software, and specifically um, um, the client side, the Java, client side JavaScript in the enterprise workspace today, and how that actually fits. Um, the question that comes up first is um, when I start to look into this: is what does enterprise software even mean? these days. Um, traditionally, this means a software that can um, extremely scale or be able to handle heavy loads, um, these sort of things. And then if you look at Wikipedia, um, it basically defines it as um, software that um, are targeted for um, corporations and groups uh, meeting those needs instead of individual, which I guess is more consumer software instead of um, 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 enterprise software. But like I said, um, it also in some degree hits both of these, um, you know, with the extreme loads and be able to actually scale to a certain degree. Um, and when I start to research what other people actually thought about these, um, of course, there's always, you know, one cynical response. And this one I find it rather interesting. It, it basically said that is actually complicated enough that um, you can build a consulting business around it. Um, well, I hope when we build this, that's not really the case, but um, you know, maybe for some of us, that's um, you know, a good thing. Um, the one thing that is true, though, is the, um, the relationship between client and server are changing. So, um, and that's what really forces um, many of the changes that we do with um, JavaScript on the client, um, on the server as well. Um, you know, traditionally, when you look at, um, you know, all this data center and with this, um, you know, um, large server farm, et cetera, that um, what we look at is, um, you know, things like requests per seconds and how we do load balancing on the web tier or the application tier and, and so forth. Um, so um, what we really focus on is getting you know, the scale and the performance out from the data center side. And while in some degree that is still true, um, the relationship between what the client can do and what the server does is, start, is what's starting to change. So from the client that we get used to, uh, mainly just a desktop, and if you're lucky, you get something fancy like this. Um, but you know the, the world today is pretty distributed. So right now we're dealing with uh, things like tablets or phones, um, in addition to desktop and you know even you know smart watches, um, and that the data can actually run pretty well on these client devices as they do on the uh, on the server. So now we start to look at the relationship between. Um, not only scale your server side code, but also on your client JavaScript code as well. Um, so what we're going to focus on um, today is um, um, about scaling on the client side and understand some of the um, uh, best practices that we have found over the last couple of years while working with this Java client side JavaScript frameworks themselves. And um, what I'm going to go over is a view of these tips or building blocks, if you will, on um, how, when, when we start to look at how you can build those enterprise applications. And um, you know, the first thing when we look into the JavaScript space, the biggest thing to start with is resisting the hype. Or um, you know, sometimes we call it, um, don't chase that shiny object. Um, so there's always something new coming out from the JavaScript world. Um, every single week there's a new library coming out 
or some new things that you can um, do. Um, so that kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, if my application can do that, that will be so cool. But you know, the, um, the reality is that um, just because that it can be done doesn't mean that it should be done. There will be some scenario where, where, where it doesn't make sense to do this type of things. Um, so, for example, the uh, air traffic controller. Um, you know, the day when we start to land planes using phone or tablet, um, you know, using REST services and client server, that kind of stuff, that's the day when I'm going to um, take on the train instead. Um, it just doesn't seem safe. Um, but anyways, um, there, there are times when, you know, it just don't, doesn't make sense to, um, to, to, uh, to make any changes. You want to stay with that, you know, uh, architecture, if you will. There's absolutely no need to ch chase that shiny object to, um, you know, to move to this client server or using the browser as a platform. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean that if you don't want to change these things, maybe there are things that you want to, um, um, to, do th to take a look at. So maybe extending it instead of replacing it. So you can keep, perhaps you, there's a scenario where you can keep the core application feature the way it is, but then the things around it, you can look into new technology to see how you can extend it. So going back to the uh, air controller um, example, for instance, that um, you know, some pieces like the, uh, the, uh, the management piece, the reporting piece where you have the charts and stuff, those are the things that you can think of moving them to the web platforms, right? Um, other things like, um, you know, maybe sending alerts to your phone, um, obviously not the critical ones because by the time when you receive it, it will probably be uh, too late. So, um, so maybe there's certain types, um, you know, we can look at things this way. So think about how the mission critical application can be extended um, or to uh, reach out to a different audience using the new technology, you know, um, with the core, around that core application features. Um, second tip is rediscovering XML. So when, um, historically when XML came out years ago with XML4, being there for uh, lasted for 13 plus years, it was really designed to describe, um, you know, scientific documents, and you know that's what they do, and for for what it's doing, it's doing pretty well. But then you start to see all these plugins coming in. You have Flash plugins everywhere. You have audio plugins and all this kind of stuff. And you know when HTML5 comes out, it was designed to basically remove all these burdens of plugins. Um, it was designed to, um, to, to, um, to basically uh, give power to HTML to, to develop application and be able to run, actually run application on the browser itself. Um, and now we're just seeing, you know, all this modern browser implementing all this uh, feature in the HTML5 specifications. And uh, one of the things that they actually added to the uh, HTML5, they have added a lot of uh, semantics into the language itself. So you see things like the, um, the, uh, the, um, the sections tag or the header tags, which are the things that enables developer to write software in accessible ways. Um, so, um, you, know, you know, writing software that can uh, be used by people with disabilities. And, um, you know, um, it's becoming more critical in today's world and not only from a legal standpoint, with over 27 countries and associations around the world that actually require your software to meet certain accessibility guidelines. Um, but, you know, it's also the right, the, the right thing to do. So, you know, if you can write software that can be, you know, used by all these audience and it's something that is easy to do, um, you know, why not doing it, right? So I'm going to um, show a quick demo on what I mean by the uh, HTML5 syntaxes and stuff. Um, so y y here you see 
you know, just some straight HTML. We have some new HTML input types that was introduced, like, um, you know, input type for color and for date. And you have a list that have a list of options that you can uh, specify. And we have a range here, which is basically um, a slider, as we'll see, that kind of thing. So, and, and then when you run it, right, then you see all these things where if you click on here, it will actually brings up a, uh, a actual color picker that I can choose color from. Or if I choose here, then I can, um, you know, switch the date and the year, et cetera. Or if I click on this, it will actually bring up the um, a, a actual date picker, right? Um, and on the list, it actually has built-in features that we, when you start to type in, it will, it will do filtering or look ahead kind of things. So, you know, all these features are provided natively by the browser. And um, of course, the downside of this is that, um, 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 you know, the, the, the vendor has different pace of implementing the features. So what you see here in Chrome might look completely different on uh, Firefox or IE, for example. So, so that's one of the downside, but um, it's also the direction that we're heading right now. Um, what is most interesting is when we start to get into um, the look and feel. Um, so when you start to, to uh, actually deploy it into um, a, as a mobile, hybrid mobile application, um, like running onto iOS or Android, for example, you will actually see the native widget on your phone, on, on iOS or on Android. So that's pretty nice. So um, going back to the um, slides. So next tip is um, uh, responsive design with CSS and JavaScript. Um, so when you look at application today, you sort of expect it to be uh, responsive. And what that means to be responsive is basically your content will adapt to the um, to, to your viewport. So when you change the size of the viewport that you're seeing, you expect it, the content to be changing. And um, you know, if you're developing on the browser or on the, on, the, on the desktop, that will probably mean just that um, you know you resize your browser and you expect it to see that your content to resize or reshape itself depending on um, you know the view size of the viewport. Now, obviously, the intent of this is changing devices. So switching from a, uh, a desktop monitor to a uh, tablet or even to a phone, right? Um, and traditionally, CSS is the, um, is the, um, is the, uh, is the, is the way that you can, uh, you, you can use to this, do this type of um, uh, responsive design, specifically uh, CSS3, which is leaps and bounds from the original CSS. Um, the the well-known um, uh, mechanism or, or, or um, commonly used for is the media query. So with the media query, the idea is that you set up all this media query and say that, you know, with this maximum width of this, then run these classes, and if it's a minimum width of this, then run these classes. And then on the screen, you basically, um, when the classes run, you see that your content actually adjusts depending on your viewport sizes, right? Um, and that sort of um, works pretty well. And that's what people have been using it for quite a number of years. Um, um, but the problem is that when you start to go from a desktop to a phone, and then the bandwidth is starting to change. That's when you start to get into issues. Um, now, for example, we're starting to look at things like I have a really big images or a chart in my, on, on my page, and I'm shrinking down this from an application um, on the desktop onto a phone. And I decided that, um, you know, this thing doesn't look too good on, um, on a small screen, so I'm going to hide it, right? Um, and that's pretty easy to do with uh, CSS. All you need to set is display to none, right? Um, but the reality is that just hiding it doesn't change the backend logic behind it. So when I'm doing this big application, right, and then I shrink it down to, um, to a phone, basically hiding half of my stuff on it, I'm still doing all this REST call, or I'm still you know, putting down all this data 
from the REST point, or, or, or I'm still fetching, you know, making HTTP requests to fetch all these large images. So, you know, um, going from a desktop where you're running on a local area network, and then you have a fast internet, that's not a problem. But then when you start to run this on a 3G phone, for example, then, you know, it's going to be run really, really slow because, you know, we're still, it was still loading data, large amount of data from the background, right? So the holy grail of this is that um, we want to get over to the JavaScript side, be able to do responsive design using JavaScript and be able to control the backend logic based on the viewport size. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that started to uh, show up about two years ago, and it's actually used, you, you see that in uh, quite a number of places. Um, the big difference here, of course, is that um, the show and hide capabilities simply hides the DOM element from the DOM tree. So the DOM is still there. Versus when you do it through the JavaScript, then it basically you take out the, um, the, the, the DOM from the DOM tree entirely. So if you're running a page on the phone and uh, you got something that you don't want to show, you just don't load it completely, right? Um, and that's really great for a high performance type of application. Um, and now there's two different libraries that I want to mention in here. Uh, first one is Response.js. And that's sort of the first library to this, do this uh, JavaScript uh, responsive API. Um, the second one is uh, introduced by a company called Zurb. They have a uh, UI framework called the Foundation, and they have a piece called the Interchange, which does this responsive JavaScripting. So now you can actually adjust the backend of your business uh, of your business logic using JavaScript, depending on the view size. Um, but you can also do things like, for instance, um, you're showing a big table. Uh, fetching a large chunk of JSON data um, and, and show that onto the desktop. But then on the phone, maybe what you want to do is show a list view instead. So you're showing a lot less data information on it. And then when people click on the item, that's when you start to um, basically drill into detail and show more detail about the item. So um, it's a different layout, different paradigm that you can do with responsive JavaScript. So you're not only changing the DOM style of things, you're also changing, you know, using a completely different REST endpoint to fetch less data. Um, so in the end, you get higher performance with uh, lower bandwidth. So with that, I'm going to show another demo. So here, let me go down right here. So basically, I, ha I have a diff with uh, two images, image A and image B. So the first image A is, uh, has a um, media query associated with it. Basically, it says that if, um, if it's um, more than 70, less than 767 pixels, then um, you know, hide it. Don't run this class. Right, and then um, image B, I have a uh, knockout piece of code wrapped around it. So basically, it will only render if uh, this uh, medium screen function is returned to true. And this is basically defined in my JavaScript code, as you see in here. So I have a variable here set up. I'm using this um, responsive knockout util, which is actually something that comes from the Oracle Jet framework to um, create this media query in my CSS. Um, and then when I run this, so here I see that both images are shown, but then when I start to um, shrink the browser, then it starts to disappear. And then in the DOM tree, you will see that for image A, is still there in the DOM tree, but um, image B is basically um, not there. So it's not rendered at all. So let's go back to the uh, slide. So my next tip is um, framework versus library. Um, there are so many options in the JavaScript world. And like I said in the beginning, there are you know, new stuff are popping up every single week and stuff. 
And not only there's new things coming out, is whatever is the coolest one of them all. So in one week, you might have a library that do a specific task, and then a few months later, you have something that came out that basically do exactly the same thing, but in a cooler way. Um, so everybody kind of um, go on and chase it and see what it does. But if you really think about it is that if you're building enterprise applications, right, um, it, it might take six months to uh, just to write the base code. And then, you know, six months is actually not a, it's a pretty short time to writing enterprise grade um, application. And by the time when you finish writing pieces of the code, um, the, the library that you're using might already be obsolete and you haven't even released your product yet. So, you know, staying on that bleeding edge is not something that you can do cleanly on the enterprise space. Um, so the question is, how do I make a decision on what to choose? And there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, like I said, there's m libraries after libraries that comes out. And then even on the, um, on the, uh, on the back end side, you have this um, libraries for maintaining the application that you need to look into, like testing frameworks and project runners and, um, and uh, scaffolding libraries, et cetera, right? So one of the ways that you can look at this is, okay, um, I got all this library that I need to look at, all these things out there. Um, maybe it's a little bit easier if I start to, um, you know, uh, break this into different purposes, right? So looking at the actual library to see what the purpose is and then try to find the best of breed among those categories and see which one fits your need better. So if you look at the um, full-blown application framework, first one come to mind is uh, Angular um, and Ember. And then you also have pieces, the, the Knockout, the Backbone, and Vue and React. Um, on the modular system side, you have Require.js, uh, Browserify, and Webpack. And Webpack is the new favorite right now. Um, on the build system, and this one is kind of interesting because, um, so, so Grunt uh, came out two to three years ago, and it's the, um, you know, it's the big kid in the block that, um, um, you know, everybody's writing plugins um, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the system. And then Guelp came along and then it's like, um, it's, it's basically does exactly the same thing, but except it uses Nook Stream. And you know, uh, you know, it's like the next best thing. And then that lasted about a year, and then Brunch came out. So, you know, it's, it's, it's um, you got a lot of um, um, uh, things to consider. So it's hard to find what the next best thing is. So, so, so sometimes it's better to find that one thing that actually fits your need. Uh, find something that has a, um, has a strong community behind it, have a strong ecosystem around it, um, so that you know that um, you can stay on it for a little while, All right? So that doesn't mean that you don't um, keep looking at the future thing. Um, you do, because the thing that you're on right now might, you know, you might need to move off from that. So um, especially, that's uh, especially true in the uh, JavaScript world. And we're talking about the difference between, you know, le looking at things every few months versus every few years, that kind of thing. And for testing framework, we have a Protractor, uh, Jasmine, QUnit. QUnit is actually what we're using internally at Oracle right now for, for Jet, and it's pretty nice framework. And we have Karma. So what it really comes down to is there's two different ways at looking at these things. Um, on one hand, you have the framework approach, and it's basically all or nothing or all in one environment. And uh, you know, Angular and Ember are you know is is the one that comes to my mind with this. And Angular, of course, is uh, backed by Google, and so it has a lot of resources behind it. And it's a really good framework as well. Um, but the thing is that um, it's all what you want to do with it. I mean, it's the Google way of doing things. So 
if you are buying into this whole Angular system, then you have to do things the Angular way, right? Um, which is perfectly fine. I mean, I'm not here to say that whether it's right or wrong to do things in such scenario. Um, what I'm saying is that um, if there's something new come along and it's something that actually fits your need, then you, with the framework approach, then you have to wait for Angular to pick that up, right? So that's one of the downside. Um, so if you're picking the framework approach, then you want to find something that is very well maintained, um, has a good company back behind it, like uh, in the case of Angular. So on the other hand, you have the library approach. So that's basically um, finding all these atomic pieces, uh, finding library for a specific need, and then, um, and, and then you know, finding the right routing library, the right data binding library, the, the UI library, which you can actually break them into, you know, further into uh, different pieces um, that you want to do. Um, now, of course, there's overhead into setting things up, right, with the library approach, because you have to make sure that all these pieces work together, and also, you know, different version and so forth. But once you have it set up, once you have something that is working for you, then it becomes much more flexible and you're in a better position to basically switching libraries in and out and so forth. So um, take the routing, um, for instance, uh, Crossrow. I don't know if you guys heard of it, but uh, it's, you know, it's a library that um, used for routing uh, two to three years ago. And um, um, it's basically a... Um, 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 it has based on the abilities to shove things into a hash system, and, but it's, it's not. It's not. Um, it's, it cannot work with uh, HTML5 history API. And when HTML5 history API comes out, then you will need this extra plugin to uh, basically get Crossflow to work. And then people are saying, okay, so maybe there's uh, better ways to do things, right? Um, so, and then there's a library call. Uh, Durandal, and it was really, really cool. Um, so if you're doing things in the library approach, you can just swap out the, uh, the, the, the existing routing pieces and then put Durandal in, right? And, and for routing, it's actually um, um, not that big of a deal because the configuration is very, very similar between all this library. So it's something that is very easy to do. Um, others might not be, uh, other pieces might not be so easy but uh, routing is a good example. And uh, speaking of Durandal, so um, when Angular, when they update to, uh, from version one to version two, they actually hired a guy who uh, wrote uh, Durandal to write their, um, their, their, their layer, uh, the routing layer pieces in Angular two. And then he basically uh, left after four months. So yeah. Uh, which brings us to the next tip. Uh, which is uh, modularity. So there's absolutely no way in today's world where you can uh, write enterprise application without considering modularity. The fact that if you have more than one developer writing on the same application forces you to look into uh, modularity. And we're talking about like in, in the view side um, or perhaps in single page application where you have someone um, basically writing the frame for the application or maybe have um, um, somebody writing multiple different pages and have them loaded in in a modular way. You, you want to be able to look at it um, this way. Um, so for example, you can split your development team into uh, developing separate pages, right? So that um, they don't basically step on each other's code. So doing things in modular way on the client side um, saves you a lot of headaches. And on the business side, it also makes sense to, um, to do things in module way too. So you have someone who will write an authentication module, someone to write the, uh, the data service module, that kind of thing. Um, and then you can reuse those pieces um, in different places in the code. And um, this is nothing new. Um, it's always been around. Um, so 
but it has to be done even on the client side in order to be able to uh, reuse our code properly. And when it's done properly, it's pretty amazing, um, you know, how great these things can be. Um, I don't know if you know about this trend, but um, apparently um, there's a huge access number of cargo containers around the world. And I thought that this cargo container can actually be reused, but turns out there's a shelf life to them. So when a cargo container cannot, you know, uh, meet the quality to uh, serve its purpose, then they're basically dumped into um, the junkyard and they're stacked up and up and up and up. And then you have architects that are coming in and, and start to turn them into homes. So, um, you know, all these houses that you see here are actually built from a cargo container. And it's pretty amazing stuff. And, you know, it's pretty cool what you can do when you start to think about doing things uh, in a modular way. Um, again, looking at some of the libraries out there that can help you work with module. Uh, these are all JavaScript side libraries. So Require.js is probably the, uh, the old man in the block. Um, mm. It's been there for a while, and it, it introduces an architecture called AMD, which stands for Asynchronous Module Definition. Uh, Webpack is one of the new ones out there and is gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, both Require.js and uh, Webpack has the ability not only to uh, load module during runtime, but they also have ability of um, helping you build um, package or file at build time. Um, Browservi, I don't know if I say that correctly, but Browservi basically does the same thing, except it, um, it, it basically uh, brings the Node.js syntax, so the required syntax, um, down to this so that you can use that as a browser also. Um, the one that I want to um, talk more about is actually uh, ES6. Um, in ES6 or ES 2015, they actually introduced the module capability. So you can actually write module in ES6. But, but the problem is that when they define, when the committee defined the spec, finalized the spec, um, they actually punt on uh, um, whether how to load module asynchronously. Um, I guess they, don't, they, they probably don't have enough time and they have to get the, uh, the spec out, so they actually punted it. In fact, they have moved that uh, piece to the HTML5 working group so that it will be uh, defined for the next release of HTML5 spec. Um, so now we have um, um, the, 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 the module loader ES6 is synchronous, that means. Um, and then in enterprise application where you have hundreds of libraries across hundreds of pages, and then if you start to uh, synchronize loading of all this module, you're going to have um, some performance issue. So there are things that you need to watch out for when you are, you know, uh, start to move to the latest and greatest things. So next tip is uh, abstraction over JavaScript and CSS. Um, I know it's hard to believe, but there's actually uh, developers who um, don't love to write JavaScript natively. Um, looking at code in a native way might not be uh, clear to some of the developer. I know if you are you know, writing JavaScript from the beginning, you're probably scratching your head. But um, if you're a developer coming from the Java world who are very used to strongly typed languages, then JavaScript starts to um, you know, look a little bit strange. Um, so that's why uh, you start to see some of this uh, library coming in, like TypeScript, um, which um, they basically they, they call it transpiling. But basically, it transpiles um, a tran um, TypeScript code uh, into JavaScript in the end. And what they do is, so while you're writing code, you actually have the ability, ability to, um, to, uh, to have strong type. Um, and on top of that, because you know exactly what type you're working, you, you, you're working with, that you'll be able to write better tools supporting on top of it. 
Um, so there's argument on both sides of whether you know strong type uh, language actually leads to uh, better programming or uh, fewer bugs. Um, what I'm trying to say is that um, you want to pick um, something that your team is comfortable with. So anyways, there's um, CoffeeScript, which is an older solution. And then TypeScript, we talk about that, and that's probably the most popular right now because of it's tied to Angular. Um, and then you have PureScript. Flow is uh, one of the new uh, ones out there, but in the end, they're all abstraction over JavaScript. Um, SAS and LESS, and these are actually abstraction over CSS, and they are CSS uh, precompilers. Um, they actually do more, so they added a uh, programming capability to uh, CSS itself. Um, by the way, um, SAS and LESS, they have a really strange history. So, so SAS come out first with a format, right? And then LESS come along, and it's basically built on top of SAS, and it's like the best, next best things. And then sometime later, SAS come back in and say, you know, I'm going to change my format to SCSS, and I'm going to build on top of LESS. Um, so it becomes the next best thing. So we have this back and forth going on between SAS and LESS that has been going on for a while. But I, I think SAS is still the, uh, the more popular one out there, and they're both great. Um, as I was saying, they both bring a programming capability to CSS, so you can start to do things like condition statements or declaring variables using loops or doing calculation using uh, math packages, um, et cetera. But um, you know, in the end, what <laughs> we're trying to do is just find a way to see the whole picture more clear. You want to be able to provide a way for developer to get to JavaScript or to get to CSS and build code in a more clear way. So the final tip, we we'll take a look at the uh, corporate frameworks out there. Um, so large companies are getting more and more involved with the open source space these days. Um, Microsoft, for example, they have been doing a lot of great things in the open source world for quite a while. Um, they, especially with the developer tools, they have contributed to a lot of open source libraries in many, many different areas. Um, the one that I can think of uh, that is related to JavaScript well, is a library called WinJS, which is a UI library. Um, Cells, uh, IBM, sorry, IBM, um, they are actually one of the founding uh, member of uh, Dojo, which is one of the original JavaScript framework. Um, although IBM right now is more involved doing Angular stuff, but uh, Dojo is still around. Um, Salesforce, they have their own thing called the Lightning Framework, which is pretty much proprietary, but is, but is built based on an open source project called uh, Project Aura. Um, SAP, they have something called the SAP Open UI5, and they, um, they have uh, pushed that to Apache Foundation uh, a while back. Um, ING is more known, for, uh, known as a financial company, but they did have a, um, have a uh, UI component framework that is built on top of Angular called Spectacular. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, so they pushed it out to open source about three and a half years ago. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem that there's any activity for the uh, past few past year and a half, which uh, doesn't sound too good. Um, PayPal has this library called Kraken.js, which is a backend uh, framework, and it's based on Node.js and Express Application Framework. And of course, Oracle, we have Jet, which uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this right now and why you should take a look at it. So what is Oracle Jet? Um, Oracle Jet stands for uh, Oracle JavaScript Extension Toolkit. And it's basically 
a, a collection of libraries instead of a framework. It's a toolkit. And with JET, we basically um, take the uh, library approach. We basically build it on top of a collection of uh, open source libraries, uh, each serving a specific need. And these are the ones that we're using. So every single UI component in JET uh, wrap around as a jQuery UI widget. So this allows us developer to reach out to a greater uh, repository of widgets that you can use. Um, so if you can't find something in JET itself or is something that you don't like, you can certainly use this, some other widgets. Uh, we use Knockout JS for the data binding layer. And um, uh, require JS is the one that we use for uh, lazy loading resources and for handling loading of modules, AMD stuff. Um, so JET is also designed um, to develop mobile application. So for that, we use this, the uh, Cordova uh, for uh, developing hybrid applications. And it's modular, so use as much as you need or use as less as you need. It's all up to you. You know, you can swap out pieces that you don't want, for example. Um, here are some of the uh, basic components. So we have basic components for the form, table, for layout, for example. And in total, we have um, 80 plus components um, that you can use out of the box at this point. Uh, we also have a set of um, advanced data visualization components. So things like charts and gauges and map, and then you see timeline in the middle, and we also have a Gantt chart that we are coming out with. Um, we created JET about three and a half years ago, and we have been using it internally within Oracle uh, for developing our own cloud products. In fact, 70% of, 70 of our cloud product uh, uses JET in some shape or form. So we know that it's scale, we know that it works well because we use it ourselves. And these are the screenshots that are coming out from our uh, BI Cloud Service Visual Analyzer. Um, this one is a screenshot coming out from uh, the Oracle Cloud, uh, Management Cloud Services. So we see here, like we have a chart um, that shows the request response time. So that's coming from Jet, all this diagram and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then we have another screenshot of the Oracle, Oracle Management Cloud um, where we, we show charts of page load time and CPU allocation, um, sorry, page view, that kind of things, page load time in the chart. So all these are Jet. Um, this one is from a uh, visual analyzer. So for example, the map here, it, it shows you know, the cell stores for each of the region uh, in, a, in a map, um, sort of um, mixing it with the chart. And uh, this is coming from, our, from uh, Apex. So if you go out and get Apex 5.1 today, you're going to get JET with it. Um, all the graphs and gauges that you see are coming from JET. And I also want, want to mention for, us to, for the Solaris, the operating system, the, uh, the web administration console, we have rewritten that using JET. So all these graph and, and gauges that you see in there, this shows you know, real time um, 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 status of the server. All those things are written in JET. Um, every single component in JET uh, fully meets the accessibility guideline. Um, so we want to make sure that all the features can be accessible through the keyboard, for example, or be able to um, 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 you know, work with the screen reader on the desktop or on the, on the mobile devices. And you know, we're pretty proud about what we have done. Um, as far as, I believe, as far as open source frameworks is concerned, I think um, accessibility-wise, we are one of the best ones out there. Um, we support 28 languages and 190 plus locale, that, uh, locale out of the box. Um, those languages include Hebrew and Arabic. 
So we support uh, languages, uh, right to left languages. So for example, if you have a GAN chart, and you're showing a GAN chart, when you change the locale to Arabic, for example, then you see all the time axes and all the taskbars, all this kind of stuff will be uh, flip over. Same thing with the table. And it's mobile ready, of course. Um, every single component that Jet provides are touch and gesture enabled. Um, not only just phones, but also on um, you know touch enabled desktop as well. Um, we provide native themes for each of the uh, mobile platforms, so iOS, Android, and Windows phones. Uh, we also provide a command line uh, tool that allows you to very quickly compile your application for um, deploying to uh, mobile devices. And the Cordova is what we use, as I talked about earlier. And if you choose to compile to uh, Android, for example, we automatically choose the uh, the Android look and feel for you, so that it will, when it run on the Android devices, you know it will look native. Same for iOS and Windows. Um, we have support built-in support to um, you know common mobile paradigm that you find in uh, common in mobile applications. So, for example, this one we showed the drawers, or we actually call it the off canvas. That you know when you when you click on it, then it will slide in and out, that kind of thing. You know, very common UI pattern. Um, the other one is uh, pull to refresh, uh, which is another one that is very common. And this one, actually, I, 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 I work on it. Um, um, you can have, um, um, it's actually exposed as, uh, as, as a utility class, so you can, uh, you can associate it with anything. So not just to list view, but it can be to any div. And you just specify a callback to the call when um, you know when you are released and it's starting to invoke the um, the, the refresh action. Um, same thing with uh, swipe to reveal. This is also a very common gesture. Um, again, this one is exposed as a utility class, so you control um, um, what the content is inside the uh, the, uh, the the swipe actions. And what to do when you know when user click on one of these um, buttons. Um, sticky list list view header is another one of them that you, you usually found in um, you know contact list on the uh, on the device, for example. So as you scroll, you basically maintain your information content. And then we also have um, have an indexer component, the one that you see on the right, uh, which again something that you found a lot on mobile applications. And it's actually written as a separate component. So it doesn't have to be associated with uh, list view. Um, but if you do associate with list view, then you can hook them up very easily and be able to, when you click on a, um, a letter, be able to scroll to the appropriate header. So you know, very easy to set up. Uh, progressive data loading, or we call it the uh, high watermark scrolling. So this is basically when you scroll to the bottom of the list, then we'll begin to uh, fetch more data. Um, the loading indicator that you see at the bottom there, um, that's actually uh, also um, themable. So um, it looks different depending on um, what devices that you're deploying to. And uh, last one. Um, uh, Jet, actually, we have our own router implementation. So, and we provide basically platform appropriate animation when you, um, you know, drill down to this view to uh, detail. So, and it's all open source. So, we are open source under the uh, universal permissive license, which is actually a step better than the MIT license. Um, it's, it's basically one step away from uh, being a public domain. And you can learn more about that uh, from oraclejet.org, or you can follow us on Twitter at oraclejet. Um, so that's it. <laughs>